welcome to the international broadcast ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates and here at No Limits, we wanna help strengthen you, encourage you and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin and I wanna thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. Bibles, I want you to turn with me to James chapter 1, and I want to read in your hearing verses 21 through 27. And when you have that, I want you to signify by saying amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Here reads the word of the Lord. The Bible says, therefore rid yourselves of all sordidness, filthiness, ungodliness, and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If anyone think they are religious and does not bridle their tongue, they deceive their hearts and their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world amen. amen and I want to talk today about rescuing the church from religious malpractice is that all right <clears throat> rescuing the church from religious malpractice as we continue our journey through the book of James I want to talk today about a subject that isn't often associated with the church. When we think about malpractice, we tend to think about legal, medical, or even financial malpractice. But rarely do we think about religious malpractice. And when I think about that, it reminds me of something that was shared with me by a senior colleague when he was a much younger pastor in the mid-1980s this well-known African-American pastor whose church happened to be a part of the largest, mostly white, Protestant denomination in the country at the time, the Southern Baptist Convention, approached some of his white colleagues about joining him in making a public statement to renounce the system of racial segregation and separation known as apartheid in South Africa. This black pastor whose name I will not mention, merely wanted to solicit the support of his white ministerial colleagues on a matter that for him was clearly unethical, immoral, and against the word of God. And when he asked a white colleague for help in mobilizing other prominent white evangelical leaders, that pastor responded by saying, my brother, we can't afford to get involved in that concern because it is more of a social issue than a spiritual one. A bit dismayed and irritated by that response, the black minister went on his way. And as fate would have it, it wasn't too long after that that in that state there arose a major controversy about legalized gambling that was on the verge of gaining approval in the legislature and among the public. And that same white pastor called the black minister to gain his support in publicly opposing the measure. And when the back black pastor received the call, the white minister concluded by saying, I'm sure you see, brother, the moral urgency and the ethical imperative that we all have in opposing this great sin. The black pastor responded, who was still young in ministry, saying to this esteemed white evangelical minister that many of you would know. He said, my brother, I'm sorry that I cannot join you. 
that sounds more like a social issue than a spiritual one to me. That story highlights for me the contradictions and the glaring hypocrisy in the church then and now about the meaning of our faith, the mission of the church, and the method in which we are to do ministry in a world that is filled with immorality, injustice, and inequality. Ever since Europeans went around the world colonizing, raping, and pillaging Africa of her resources and exporting her people to the Caribbean, North, and South America, and doing so in the name of Jesus, we have had to endure the conflict and the collision between how the oppressor understood Christianity and how the oppressed understood our faith. This is the thesis of the book Slave Religion by Professor Albert J. Rabito. And to this very day, we still see this kind of blatant duplicity and hypocrisy in the church. Just recently, mostly white, right-wing, conservative, so-called Christian evangelicals raised over $2 million in defense of Daniel Penny, an ex-Marine who was charged with strangling Jordan Neely, a homeless black man with mental illness in New York City. These Christian race crusaders labeled Daniel Penny a good Samaritan, an insane assertion that distorts the Bible to justify their white supremacist ideology. There, there are countless other examples of the way in which conservative and evangelical Christians today are using their religion to rationalize injustice, to justify bigotry, and to cloak the cross in the flag to condone white Christian nationalism. They claim, on the one hand, to support life, but they oppose policies, on the other hand, that would help to enhance life. They, they utter ethical platitudes about God, the Bible, and morality, but they support politicians investigated for sex trafficking, uh, Matt Gates and indicted for fraud and money laundering, this guy in New York, and, and a presidential candidate indicting uh, for rape. They are guilty of what I'm calling today religious malpractice. And James pins this missive from antiquity to address these same kinds of theological contradictions that seem to plague the early church. James wrote, this short yet salient epistle to confront varieties of Christian proclamation that undermine the church, that jeopardize its witness and it interferes with the reception and the spread of the gospel around the world. And James offers to them then and to us now a roadmap for rescuing the church from religious malpractice. And and James start by saying uh, that, first of all, we need to restore the credibility of the church. That, in essence, is the point of verses 21 through 25. When you read it, there were Christians who knew all of the rules and who performed all of the rites and the rituals of the church. The problem was that their behavior did not line up with what they proclaimed. They were, they were the Christian nationalists of the ancient world who said one thing in private but did another thing in public. And inconsistency is what robs the church of its credibility and compromises its witness in the world. And so James says, you got to get rid of all of that. Get rid of the duplicitous discipleship, fraudulent faith, and misleading ministry that pushes people away from Jesus us rather than drawing them nearer. He says, welcome with meekness the implanted word of God that has the power to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not just hearers only who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror for they look at themselves and on going away, they immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect and graft law, the word of God, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed. 
in their doing. James uh, is addressing religious malpractice, the tendency to engage in negligent behavior that causes harm and injury to someone else. These uh, Christians hear the word, uh, but then they don't do the word uh, that they hear. Oh, they jump really high when they shout, but they don't walk that straight when their feet hit the ground. Uh, they speak in tongues of uh, angels in the building, uh, but they'll cuss you out in English in the park lot and that disconnect between word and deed between what you say and what you do undermines the credibility and the authority of the church in the world if there is one thing that we need more of today it is Christians committed to living out their faith rather than just using their faith as a weapon against other people be doers of the word and not just hearers only I want you to do justice and love and mercy and walk humbly with our God. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself and not just your black neighbor or your white neighbor or your neighbor who looks like you and thinks like you and dresses like you and believe not just your neighbor in your fraternity, your sorority and your lodge, but you need to go across the aisle and even go across the border and love your Mexican neighbor, your Muslim neighbor or your atheist neighbor. If you're a Democrat, love your Republican neighbor. If you're a Republican, love your Democrat neighbor. If you are straight, love your gay, lesbian, and trans neighbor. If you are gay, lesbian, or trans, love your straight neighbor. So that by walking the walk and not just talking the talk, we can restore the credibility of the church in the world. Have I got a witness here? And when we do that, when we restore the credibility of the church, that will then enable us to reframe the conversation of the church. Hear the word of the Lord in verse 26. It says, if you claim to be religious, but you don't bridle or control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. And your religion is in vain. It is worthless. This verse is often quoted as a prohibition against using profanity in the church. But I think there is something more profound here than whether saying four-letter words is a sin that James is trying to underscore. James, I think, is trying to tap into the heart of Proverbs 18.21 where the proverb says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. <laughs> in other words, there is power in our mouths. Church, and as children of God, how we use our mouths and the words uh, that we speak have the potential uh, to create death or life in another individual. The words that we speak have the potential. They have the power to create death or life in your situation. Your words can either leave a person feeling dead or our words, somebody say our words, our, our words can either lift people up or they can pull people down. And yet sadly Christians all too often engage in death talk by speaking words of death over themselves, words of death over others, and words of death even about God. Someone recently called these words death derivatives, words of doubt and shame and fear, words of humiliation and manipulation, words of deceit and toxic beliefs that we end up putting in the atmosphere, words like I'm not worthy, I'm powerless, I, I can't do any better, I'm to blame, something's wrong with me, words like I'm no good. These are words that when you examine them, they are part of the rhetorical substratum of what of the kind of conflict and then a personal wounding that many people are facing today. And James says that those words, those statements, those kinds of disparaging words are death. And he wants believers to keep your mouth under control when you are ever tempted to use words that'll pull you down rather than build you up. Because when people hear believers speak, they should hear us speak words of life and not death. 
when people hear you at home or on your job, when they overhear your conversation on the phone, they should hear us speaking to people's higher selves. If God made us, if God made our children, if, if God made our spouses, our partners, our, our friends, our co-workers, even, even strangers uh, uh, on the train uh, in his image and in his likeness, then when people leave an encounter with children of God, they ought to feel that the words that we have spoken are congruent with what God has said about them. So bridle your tongue, John, John James says. If you cannot speak life to people, bridle your tongue. If, if your words cannot lift up your child or, or lift up your husband or lift up your wife or lift up that stranger, when people leave our presence, they should leave with a sense of what God says about them and not death. When people leave our presence of life and not death or negativity should be left in the atmosphere. They should leave with a sense of what is possible. They should leave with a sense that they can make it, that they can survive, that they can run on, that they can stand. They, they should leave with a sense that they can take on the world, not that they are inadequate and flawed and failures. And the problem with much of contemporary Christianity Christianity and our rhetoric is uh, that when people leave us, they feel more condemned and more judged and ridiculed. They feel derision and scorn and division and hatred and that they are not loved by God. I meet more people today suffering from church hurt than anything else. That is not Christianity. That is not the gospel. So from now on, I want you to speak life and not death over yourself. Let's stop speaking negatively and pessimistically and discouragingly about the circumstances of our, of our life. Let, let, let's stop speaking negatively about our sense of what is possible, about our capacity to make it through a storm in our no more negative predictions about whether you can make it. Somebody shout no more. No more negative prognostications about your future. No more words of despair that you are not going to survive. The devil is a liar. You will survive. Have I got a witness here? Somebody shout, I will survive. I'm going to make it through this sickness. I, I'm going to make it through this relational issue. I will survive. Somebody needs to start speaking words of life over yourself. Somebody shout, no more. No more death talk spoken over the lives of other people. No more death talk spoken over your children or spoken over your partners or spoken over your... No more death talk spoken over your preacher, your pastor, your, your church. Your, no more death talk speak all over your family and your future. Somebody shout, no more. <laughs> Any speech that promotes gossip and rumors and slanders and puts people down or degrades people because of their background, their race, their gender, their weight, their complexion, their country of origin, their economic status, or their, and no more of that, James says, uh, that kind of talk is vain and it is worthless. No more. I've heard parents tell their children that they aren't going to be anything. And then the child hears that and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that becomes embedded in their psyche. Paul told the church at Rome that they should always esteem others more highly than you esteem yourself. Proverbs says that a kind word can turn away wrath. And when, a, when you are a Christian, James would have us to know that what you say to and about others is critical. And if you don't have anything good to say, then grandmama was right. Then just don't say it anything at all. Bump your neighbor, say neighbor, watch your mouth. Watch what you say about yourself and watch what you say about others and watch what you even say 
about God. It is not uncommon for people to speak negatively about God. To say things like the Lord has forgotten about me. Or why has God allowed this miscarriage, this divorce, this layoff, this foreclosure to happen to me? I can see if it happened to them, but not me. God has abandoned me, or there must be no God, because why would a good God allow bad things to happen to me? A good person who prays and preaches. There, there is no God. God must not love me. I've heard people say things. Why is everything good seemingly happening for my neighbor, but nothing good is happening for me? And to be sure, the more we begin to rehearse these negative thoughts, the more likely we are to begin to believe them, and they become ingrained in your body and in your spirit. But I want to declare today to somebody listening that God does love you, that God does care about your child, that God is able to do anything but fail. Have I got a witness here? Somebody shout, God is able. He's able to heal me. He's, he's able to deliver me. He's able to pick me up. He's able to strengthen me. I, I may, somebody shout, I'm able. I, I'm able to get through this. I, I'm able to get over this. I, I'm able to get around it. Somebody shout, we going to make it. Yeah, We're going to make it through this year. We're going to make it through this season. And we are going to make it through this storm. Have I got a witness here? See? You got to learn how to replace that negativity with positivity. Replace the can't with can. Replace the won't with will. Replace that saying you can't do uh, to, to what you can do. Replace uh, that looking at the fact rather than looking at the facts. You got to start standing on your faith. I, I know what the doctor says he see on the x-ray, but, but you don't follow the facts. You, uh, you got to stop looking at your sickness and start looking at his stripes rather than counting your burdens. You got to start counting your blessings rather than numbering the people who left you. You got to start being grateful for the people who are left. Have I got a witness here? Rather than crying over what you don't have, you need to start shouting and you need to start dancing and you need to start singing about what you have left. Is there anybody here today who can thank God for what you have? Have I got a witness here? Is there anybody here today who decide I'm going to count my blessings, I'm going to name them one by one, I'm going to count my many blessings and see what God has done. Neighbor, you got to learn how to speak life over yourself. Yolanda Adam was right every now and then. You got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time for you to encourage yourself. Come on, speak to your other neighbor say, neighbor, encourage yourself. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you are right now, but you just encourage yourself. You didn't come this far for you to give up now. <laughs> Have I got a wit? I know the devil, I know the devil had a dark cloud over your head. But look at you now, honey. <laughs> you in church, you got a smile on your face, you got a boo beside you, or oh, one at home you gonna see tonight, you are still. Come on, somebody ought to thank God that I'm still here. <laughs> after all of the hell, after all of the heartache, after all of the struggles, I'm still. Come on, you ever, you ever look back over your life and you say, Lord, I thank you that after everything I've been through, I still got joy. I still got praise. And as long as there's blood running warm in my veins, as long as I got breath in my lungs, I'm going to give God the best praise. These, these are the kinds of positive affirmations about God 
that we ought to be putting in the atmosphere so that you can feed your spirit and nurture your soul until your change comes. The Apostle James is encouraging us to be mindful of the power that's in your mouth. Tell your neighbor, watch your mouth. Watch. watch. You got power in your mouth. You've got healing in your mouth. You can speak hope. You can speak truth. You can speak peace. Peace can enter the atmosphere at your house because of what's in your mouth. Tell your neighbor, watch, watch your mouth. What, watch your mouth. Whenever you are tempted, whenever you are tempted, to think negative, you got to spot it. You got to spot it. Uh, nope, I see it right there. You got to spot it, then you got to stop it. First you spot it. Tell your neighbor, spot it. Whenever you are tempted to say something, no, nope, you spot it. Then, then you got to stop it. You tell your, nope, say, nope, don't say it, self, don't say it, don't say it. You got to spot it, then you got to stop it, then you got to swap it. You take the negative, then you put something positive right there. Have I got a witness here? And once you do that, God is going to turn your situation around. Have I got a witness in here today? We have to restore the credibility of the church. We've got we've to reframe the conversation of the church. And when we do that, church, we'll then be able to renew the courage. Somebody say courage of the church. That's my final point. That the reason the church's credibility needs to be restored and the reason our conversation needs to be reframed is because our courage needs to be renewed. Listen to verse 27. It says this, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. This verse, James 1:27, suggests that the credibility and the conversation of the church are substantiated by the courage of the church to serve those who are oppressed in a corrupt world. Most versions of the Bible, perhaps like the one you're, you're reading right now, translate the main verb in verse 27 as caring for or visiting orphans and widows. But the Greek here is more accurately translated interceding on behalf of, advocating for, or fighting for the rights of orphans and widows in their distress. I'm working on something here. And so the admonition here extends beyond church merely sending get well cards, uh, printing their name in the bulletin, or visiting them in nursing homes. And those things are fitting and proper and necessary. But, but James is saying something more profound than that. James is saying that the measure of real ministry and genuine Christian compassion are determined by what you do for those at the bottom of the social ladder. See, in the ancient world, orphans and widows were those who had no rights and no privileges and no opportunities. Orphans and widows were cast down and cast aside. They were the untouchables of the ancient world. They were locked out by the system, left out by society, and forgotten by the government. And so what James is saying is that if your religion is to have any meaning or relevance, it is demonstrated by what you do for those whom society ignores and that church takes courage somebody shout courage James would take issue with those who say to preachers like me that you ought to just preach Jesus and have nothing to do with addressing social ills James would challenge those who restrict matters of faith to issues of personal piety like prayer and reading the Bible while ignoring issues of public engagement those individuals imagine a Jesus who was only concerned about the state of souls 
souls are bound for heaven, but who was disinterested in the bodies and the systems and the social structures that those souls had to live in down here on earth. But that is not the Jesus that I know. No, that is not the Jesus of my grandmother and my grandfather and my Emma forebearers. The Jesus that I know said that when I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And if you have done it unto the least of these, my sisters and brothers, then you have done it unto the Jesus that I know said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are in chains and shackles. That's the Jesus that I know. I side with Dr. King on this matter. Dr. King said any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the slums that cripple them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually dead religion awaiting burial. That, that's what James is saying. He is saying that the church should not be silent in the face of injustice committed against the most vulnerable among us. This version of Christian extremism today that regards denying choice to women and threatening to lock them up in jail while proposing to do nothing to the men that impregnate those women and then lead those women to raise those children by themselves is not the gospel. This version of Christianity that's about policing what people do in the privacy of their bedrooms but ignoring the immorality that is happening in corporate boardrooms, that is not the Bible. That is about focusing on who people like and love and restricting civil liberties of gender and sexual minorities that is not based upon the word of God. This religious fanaticism on the right that wants to ban books and ban amusement parks and do nothing about God, guns in the process and to cut social programs for those in poverty while increasing corporate subsidies and tax cuts for the rich. There's something wrong and insane about what's happening today. When we are serious about our faith and are truly committed to the cause of Christ, we won't mind speaking out and standing up for those who cannot speak out and stand up for themselves. But that takes courage. Somebody say courage. Come on, say it again, courage. Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, do you have courage? We saw this kind of courage demonstrated firsthand a few months ago by those three state legislators in Nashville, Justin Pearson, Justin Jones, and Gloria Johnson. They protested because they were tired. They were sick and tired of hearing people give lip service to gun violence, claiming to issue prayer, and then refusing to pass any policy. It is, it is a disparagement of prayer for you to say, I'm praying for you, but I'm not going to do anything about it. We need to restore the courage of the church today. And I was overjoyed to see a photo of young Justin Jones with my good friend, Pastor John Faison of the Watson Grove Church in Nashville. He's, he's been here today. He, and what we saw a few months ago was this young man. It was an outgrowth of his courageous faith. Are y'all listening to me here today? What we saw from Justin was an outgrowth of his trust in God. And we need more Christians. And we need more preachers of the gospel who are just like that. There are people in our midst and around, all around us that have been systematically marginalized and unfairly treated. And the church and those in it need to use our platform to lift up their plight. But sadly, many of us are not. 
I remember riding on the subway in New York City many years ago. And when I was on the train, there were these two guys next to me. One was standing next to me like I was, and the other was sitting down. And the one who was standing noticed that his friend was sitting on the train with his eyes closed. He seemed worried, and so he said to his friend, hey, man, what's, what's wrong with you? Are you asleep? Are you sick? Are you not feeling well? And his friend looked up at him and put his finger over his mouth and whispered, no. To which the other guy who was standing said, brother, well, if you're okay then, why are you whispering and why are you riding the train with your eyes closed? And the other guy responded, man, because there was a pregnant lady standing in front of me. And if I opened my eyes and saw her condition, my conscience would have compelled me to give up my seat. And so I'm riding the train with my eyes closed because I do not want to see the need of this woman in front of me. And sadly, church, there are too many preachers and, and churches and Christians who are just like that man. We have, we have become comfortable riding the subway train of life, keeping our eyes closed so that we don't have to see the trouble, the pain, and the despair that is in front of us. There are people trying to stack the judicial, political, and economic system against us, but we are seated and we got our eyes closed. There are people who are in trouble being victimized because of their race, their religion, their country of origin, their gender, their sexuality, and their political ideology, but there are too many people in the church who just care about me, my job, my family, my house, and to hell with everybody else. Y'all not here today. I'm sick and tired of, and we can fill arenas, and we can fill churches as long as you give people a cute self-help message with three points, a hymn, and a close, because all people care about is their car, and their closet, and their clothes, and their cash and their business and their red bottoms and their, their Louboutin, their nice back, their this, their, their that. But once you try to inspire people to take their blessing and to go out in the world to make it a better place, tell your neighbor we got to open up our eyes. That was the wrong neighbor. Tell your other neighbor we got to open our eyes. We got to open our eyes because right now there are leaders in Washington once again who are using this made up, trumped up debt limit crisis. They did it in 2011 uh, with Obama, tried to use this artificial debt limit as a tool to try to deny poverty programs for the most vulnerable among us. And yet, nobody's talking about it the way that we need to be. And so the question becomes, what will we do? Will we keep riding the subway of life with our eyes closed while the world goes to hell and a hand mask it? It is amazing to me that the same people talking about the deficit and the debt, and the debt limit. Raise the debt limit three times under the yellow orange president, raising the debt limit $7 trillion. But now, all of a sudden, they are concerned about fiscal responsibility and spending. Why is it, this is just a commercial from my message, I'll get back to it in a minute. Uh, why is it that whenever spending is done for the poor, whenever spending is, is focused on Medicare or Medicaid, or whenever the spending is for people who are at the bottom of the social economic ladder, whenever the spending is for public welfare, which is only a spine minute small, uh, a, a fractional of percent of the overall federal budget. You would think that the way they talk about welfare and people needed to work in order to, for them to get public benefits, you would think that it is the majority of the federal budget. The devil is a lie. That is not the case. The biggest recipients of public aid are corporations and banks and financial institutions and they line up at the counter of public aid every day at four Four o'clock to get central bank reserves, which you give them, which we give them. And nobody has a problem with that. 
And yet we allow them to scapegoat black and brown people, women and single mothers and the poor and our seniors. We better open up our eyes. Tell your neighbor, we better open up our eyes. Okay, I'll get back in my sermon. We have got to open up our eyes to the contradictions that are happening in the world today and ask ourselves why are more Christians interested in feeling good than doing good, in getting their praise on than getting our schools improved and eradicating our poverty. Forty years ago, the American church saw its mission as saving the soul of America, and now the mission of our churches has become blessed me, my family, my kids, and nobody else. But James closes this missive by asking the church, do you have a good religion? Our ancestors would have put it this way. Is you got good religion? Good religion knows how to help somebody. Good religion knows how to lift somebody. Good religion knows how to save somebody. And so if we are to rescue the church from religious malpractice, we must ask ourselves, do we have good religion? Will we restore the credibility of the church? Will we reframe the conversation of the church so that we can renew the courage of the church? Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord praise today. In the 17 years I've been pastoring, there is one area that I have found in which people consistently struggle. That is in establishing a daily routine to spend time in the presence of God, something I believe is so critical to growing in Christ. To help you begin each day with the Lord, I have developed the No Limits Daily Devotional email that is available to you for free. This devotional contains a Bible reading, some commentary, and a closing prayer. It is a great way to start your day in communion with God. Request to begin receiving your free devotional emails right now at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you in advance for signing up, and I pray it helps you live each day with no limits. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.